England's World Cup preparations have taken yet another downturn following their first ever defeat against Fiji on Saturday. Today, the Rugby Paper podcast is discussing that defeat as well as looking at the prospects of Scotland ahead of the World Cup. Joining us today to do so is former Scotland fly half Duncan Hodge. The next international rugby fixture will be that Rugby World Cup opener next Friday between France and New Zealand. The warm-ups are done. Summer Nations series is behind us. Um, particularly exciting for most people, maybe not if you're an England fan, but if you hail from Scotland, like today's special guest, that's certainly the case. Um, former Scotland fly half joins us today. Duncan Hodge, how are you doing, Duncan? Yeah, very well, thank you. Very good. Good. Where are you calling us from? Uh, just at home just now. Got a bit of coaching this afternoon. Um, but yeah, just at home. Sunny day in Edinburgh, no surprise. Is that you're still in coaching then at the moment? Yeah, yeah. So I've got kind of a few hats on. I do some stuff with a pro team up here, Sterling Wolves, coach at a couple of schools. We work for World Rugby and I've got my own sort of coaching business. So it's, uh, it's a less stressful life than, you know, Edinburgh and Scotland over the last 12, 15 years. But no, I'm loving it. Yeah, amazing. Is it, pressure free, is it pressure free, Duncan, or not quite? I uh, know it's I wouldn't say it's pressure free, it's just different sort of pressure. I end up coaching a lot of kids, which is different. But I mean the main thing was um I've got my kids are 15 and 13, and I just need to be a parent till they leave home, if I'm being honest. Um and look, I didn't I loved what I was doing. I absolutely loved what I did, and I would never ever change it. However, that was 25 years worth pretty much weekend after weekend of playing for 15 and then oh, I'm sorry playing for 10 pro and then pretty much 15 coaching and um it's it's just a lot with family life and you know days off are not really days off you know Saturday you're coding and you're working and you're in on Sundays and you've got 50 pro athletes to prepare to present to on Sundays and Mondays and you know your day off on a Wednesday it doesn't it's no it's no use to anyone <laughs> might be useful for me in the golf course but it's no use to my wife and kids so it sounds like you are not thinking about a potential return to say a URC coaching opportunity came along or you were involved with Fiji, such thing came along, you wouldn't necessarily... Not, not just now. I mean, literally, I've got a couple of years where I'm just sort of buckling down and being a, a dad and I'm enjoying loads of different types of coaching and just sort of gaining experience then. And it's not, I never say never, but certainly for the next couple of years, it's um, family life, coaching school team at the weekend and running stuff in the holidays so uh yeah no not 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 at that stage yet getting the kids into rugby yeah i've got a daughter who's into sort of sport and hockey and we man is, was a played a lot of football but loves his rugby and his cricket if i'm being honest so um it's not a bad mix for a, for a dad so you know those two kids that enjoy lots of team sports that i enjoy also enjoy so it's, it's pretty good sporting family i guess that's probably not surprising is it um let's rewind to your um international coaching with Fiji obviously the headline of the weekend the biggest headline and we'll start with that before we get to Scotland was the Fijian win at Twickenham um tell us about your time at Fiji first of all yeah I mean it was a really bizarre one I, I just left Edinburgh about three months before and then I got a couple of calls from mate Nathan Hines and then Richie Gray sort of saying you know I, I'd sort of plan to take maybe three four months off and so all right okay I'll just you know play golf and see my kids and but life just doesn't work like that so I got a couple of calls and they said oh what are you doing in in November I said oh not masses I've just got a few bits on and it was obviously COVID times and I worked with Vern Cotter for two or three years at Scotland and none of the staff from the other side from sort of New Zealand could could fly and could work so yeah, sort of jetted in there. They sort of got a staff. So Gareth Baber was head coach. He'd coached them sevens, myself, Richie Gray, Rory Best, and then they sort of assembled some external physios and S and C. Um, and yeah, so basically had a, a month of three and a half weeks um, in Madrid and Cardiff, locked in a hotel. <laughs> Coaching 26, there's a squad of 26, um, and it was an amazing experience, incredibly lucky. And my only slight in was that four of the guys had played at Edinburgh. So Roni Sau, Bill Mata, um, Mesu Kunavula, and Leroy, uh, tight prop, they'd all played with me. So uh, there was a tiny bit of familiarity. And then with Gareth, Gareth Baber as well. Um, he'd obviously coached the sevens team out there and knew them pretty well. So, yeah, we sort of arrived on a Sunday night in Madrid and played Spain five days later. 
uh, Wales seven days after that, and then drew with Georgia back in Madrid uh, another six days after that. So like it was an amazing month, um, totally out my comfort zone. Um, so, sort of, you know, it was it was it was it was just quality, just totally different culturally. Um, the way I've somehow described it since is like a sort of stag weekend with no alcohol. The, these guys just love each other. They just, they're such good mates. Um, they get up in the morning, they're whooping, they're hollering, you know, we'd sort of church service at night. Um, and, you know, you just do all you can to sort of muck in and try and adapt to their culture and which wasn't always the easiest, um, but, you know, I, I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Um, very, very different, totally out of my comfort zone, but a huge sort of learning and total privilege for me, if I'm being honest. Tell us about what you were, well, you were just saying it off air, actually. It was super, um, very, very interesting. The sort of shortcomings in the Fijian coaching setup and style that maybe you no longer feel is impacting them in 2023, negatively, that is. Yeah, I mean, the things at the time there were, you know, literally, we, we, we all arrived on a sort of Sunday night and we'd sort of five, six days to prepare. Now, in my sort of world, you know, working at Edinburgh, Scotland, you know, I know the prep that goes into essentially tier one sort of an autumn, autumn internationals or six nations, where you've got a couple of weeks in camp. So you've got three or four mini camps and you've got 40 players on tap and you've got 15 against 15. You know, and I think COVID had an impact, but, you know, we had 26 players of which two or three are injured. So, you know, we training numbers weren't great. Um, you know, literally we couldn't do much training. It was kind of like high level management, getting a team functional without curbing them because, you know, they want to play how they want to play. And quite rightly so, you never ever want to detract that. You know, so it had its sort of challenges. And at the time, you know, always probably with Fijian rugby, you're going to get targeted up front, set piece, small, you know, they're going to target front five who maybe don't play that high level of rugby. At that time, for example, Ben Volavola was playing 10, who was sort of third choice at Stad, not getting much rugby. So it's probably a couple of things now when you evolve it through and you see them beating England at the weekend. And the first would be the Drew, the team over in Super Rugby, who you've got now a front five who are playing every week. You've got a nine and 10 who are playing every week and are just learning how to manage a game, fitness, all these sorts of things. Um, and plus in this last three months, you know, and I, I can't really comment, but I'm assuming they've had a three month block of SNC fitness, um, you know, adding in some layers of gameplay and structure and just things that you can't do in five days before a, before a test match in autumn. So and we all know the the level of talent that is there. Um, so it just makes total sense to me that we're sort of seeing these results um, and probably the discipline bit on top now. Um, and, you know, knocked over England at the weekend. So speaking as a, as a 10, uh, Duncan, uh, what... I felt on Saturday, and we, we we all go back with it, you know, I mean, Fiji have had some great tens of a, of a particular style. I mean, we go back to Serevi, um, and, you know, Vola Vola could do a thing or two. Um, you had Scrum Hearts the same, you know, Matavalu, and, and, and um, I mean, they, they, they were sort of... Uh, almost like nuclear fission players. You, 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 it was just an explosion of... Of, of a combination of, of, of raw talent and imagination and, and backing themselves and backing their own individuality and all that kind of thing. It seemed to me on Saturday with Munts that you had a 10 who actually understood percentage rugby. And I'm not trying to make everything sound really dull here, but in terms of the structure that you've just referred to, there's a bloke who, can, who understands structure and, under, and his game instincts and his game management instincts seem to be quite high, even though he's quite a young bloke. Yeah, and I think that's that's probably an individual thing. And I, I probably think it's a volume of training load over the last three months as well, whereas it's not only him, it's the players around him that are all now probably on a different tactical sort of level, as it were. So I, I think the, the sort of combination of the two, of the, the sort of training volume, plus you've got a 10 in there who... Who has got those skill set, but also has got a big volume of rugby under under his belt in the last couple of years as well. Like, and it is, you know, <laughs> every game you're gonna you're gonna talk about tens, you're gonna target tens. They're, they're just such a crucial position that 
you know, if, if you're if you're only getting fifty percent of your decisions right, you're going to struggle. Whereas, but no one's going to be perfect. But if you're getting 80, 85, then you're going to be, you know, a team like Fiji is going to be competing against anyone, as as I see it. So I think that is a, a massive factor. The sort of nines and tens, and and how they're playing, and how more comfortable they are with sort of test rugby. It looks like. Is this to say then? Obviously. You say that Fiji are most likely fitter. I think we saw that it was around the 74th, 75th minute against England, where England were, you know, really taking it to them. And Fiji put in a massive defensive set, which you could argue, you know, the Fiji of, well, the Fiji that we know, those last 20 minutes, that's where they leaked most of their points. So I think that was very, very telling. But is that you saying then with someone like Munce at 10, with improved fitness, with improved structure, with the talent that they have, Fiji's no longer a banana skin, but don't get me wrong, England were poor, but still you're taking down one of the rugby heavyweights and all of a sudden everyone could be in trouble. Yeah, well, again, I think it's a combination of everything. It probably, again, without having that negative slant on it, but the fewer mistakes they make, the more time they're spending with the ball than without the ball. And look, they love having the ball. So, and it takes more energy to defend, you know, plus fitness plus discipline you know you know you guys talked about me coaching you know almost a couple of years ago now but you know we play Wales we're, we're going great 25 minutes and then Aroni Sao gets sent off and you're gonna struggle to you know win the game from there and similar if you back up a couple of yellow cards and you're playing with 13 14 men for big chunks of test matches you're gonna you're you're gonna be defending longer than you are attacking which saps your energy and you know, it, it just sort of drains your drains your fitness. So I think there's probably again there's there's a, there's a combination of everything in there. Is it reassuring for you as a Scott Duncan that you can't play Fiji until the semi-finals? <laughs> well, I mean that whole group is going to be quite <laughs> something, isn't it? I mean, I saw something I think online last night where it, it kind of ranked the the seedings and the pools, and the point that was being made was. Like obviously this 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 the seeding bit's a different argument, but the point being made by I can't remember where it was, but essentially said the pools, essentially the top two pools are seeded one to six, and the next two are seeded sort of, you know, whatever it was, seven to eleven. So in a World Cup sort of point, you know, it doesn't matter the, the standard of the pool, but the pool is gonna be, you know, the pool itself is gonna be it's gonna be mental. You know, you got you know Wales, Georgia, you know Fiji, Australia. You know that's that's you know you know whatever it is five six huge games of rugby. Whereas that I don't think we've potentially we've seen that in in previous World Cups. No, correct me if I'm wrong, but I would say three of the pools you can't say for sure which two teams are going to get through. I think we're all in agreement that New Zealand and France will likely get through their pool. Yeah, Whereas I don't think you could say that there are any almost nailed on couple of teams to go through now especially not after this weekend yeah no I'd, I'd agree with that that's interesting nick how was twickenham yeah uh it was weird really weird really really weird atmosphere i was kind of like walking away i was very much sort of shocked but not surprised is how i would describe it um a bit like watching your best mate get the lethal injection sort of it's been coming for quite a while uh, something like that, but for it to actually happen was was really shocking. And I know people will like some people listening to this will think, oh, that's just such English arrogance. The idea that you know your team can't be beaten by a tier two nation and everyone else can. But forty six games England have played against current tier two nations or below, and every single time they've won, and they've never really been in a situation where they've been in big trouble. You know, people will point to the Samoa game in the 2003 World Cup. I'm sure there are a couple of other examples where England have been close to being in trouble, but um, they, they 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 never never to the extent that they were in into the last 10 minutes on Saturday, and then they obviously lost it anyway. And I made a list of some of the records that England have broken for themselves in the last eight years, and there are some positive ones in there, I'm sure, but I've left those ones out. So, uh, first group stage Rugby World Cup exit. First finish or fifth of fifth or below since the five nations became six. First six nations campaign with defeat in all three Triple Crown games since 1986. 
First loss to Scotland at home in 38 years. First loss to Argentina at home in 16 years. Biggest ever home defeat. And first defeat to a current tier two nation. That's things that England have done in the last eight years alone. Are the, are the wise okay? Yeah, I think, I think you know, um, that's just like, I just couldn't believe it. Even after the press conference after, I was like, surely, surely there's going to be some kind of extra time to be played to make sure England win. But no, Fiji were terrific. <laughs> Fiji were terrific. Um yeah. And and also, particularly given the start they had, I thought after the start, I thought, OK, normal services resumed. But um, they were just totally in control. I mean, you know, you look at the possession and territory stats for a start, they fully deserved it. And um, and they made, as Law said on the front page of the rugby paper, they made England look pretty silly. And as Duncan said, Fiji like to play with the ball. At the moment, England like to play without it, right? So it almost, you know fed into their hands, hence the possession territory stats. Um, Chris, I wanted to ask you, obviously, first defeat to a Tier 2 nation. Um, a lot of people are calling this England's worst defeat ever. Now, it's quite a sweeping question, but 76-0 to Australia springs to mind, 36-0 to South Africa, maybe. Uh, that defeat to France earlier this year in the Six Nations, Argentina last year. But where do you think this ranks? Well, I... <laughs> I was there for the I was there for the seventy six nil game, um, but that was England eight. You know, I mean Woodward had left a whole chunk of people. But I mean, I, it's a great quiz question. I defy anyone to name the back division that played for England that night. But if you if you if you if you if you think that Matt Perry was playing outside centre, um, and there's a load of, loads of people who were one cap wonders in that game, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. No Who's one playing ten, Chris. Who was playing ten? Who was playing ten? Um, uh, some Wilkinson bloke who oh. missed who missed who missed a couple of shots in front of the sticks. Um, Scott Benton played at scrum half. Steve Ravenscroft played at inside centre. Um, um, Austin, what's his name? Um, played on the wing. Uh, yeah, I mean it, it was it was an odd it was it was an old experience that game, um, and no one knew what to say to Clive Woodward afterwards. So. I put my hand up and asked him if he felt he'd been a little bit, if England had been a bit exposed with the restarts. And he didn't think that was a very funny joke. So the press conference, <laughs> Duncan, Duncan would, would probably not have, would not have appreciated t- such a tongue in cheek question if he'd been on the wrong end of a 76 nil beating. I mean, so that was an old game, the 36 nil game um, against South Africa in 2007. I mean, that was clearly a World Cup match and therefore England were as at full strength as they could possibly be. It just happened not to be very strong. Wilkinson was injured and, and I mean, they didn't have an outside half on the field. Andy Farrell played 10. Andy Farrell played 10 in that game. Um, and of course, things turned around during that tournament. They, they went on to, to reach the final. I just think is, and I'm not one of life's great patriots and I, I particularly dislike what I would call the English form of arrogance. And I think some of the coverage of what happened at the weekend is a fantastic example of of turbocharged English arrogance. The, the the notion that Fiji cannot conceivably, under any circumstances, come to Twickenham and win makes me feel physically sick. I actually think it's a good result for it's a fantastic result for Ireland's rugby. I think it's a good result for world rugby. I think it was a good performance by Samoa. Um, uh, against the Irish, who were not absolutely at full strength, but Samoa could certainly have won that game. Um, I'm all I'm all for tier two nations or wh- whatever condescending uh, title you want to put on them. I'm all for them climbing the ladder and, and, and beating the usual suspects. I think it's fantastic. I thought Fiji were absolutely brilliant on Saturday. I thought England were very poor. But hey, you know, New Zealand were very poor the night before. They just happened to be playing against a side that people expect to win. Um, unlike Fiji, who people assume aren't going to win. So uh, I think there's some there are some missteps in the coverage born of, I don't know Duncan's view on this, but Scots in the past have described it as English arrogance. Um, and I think we saw some of that at work in the weekend with the coverage. Duncan, before you comment on English arrogance, here's a bit of English arrogance for you. Um, I didn't actually get this email, but I've heard of an email from England Rugby Store after the game against Fiji where they had pre-prepared an email and it said, England win, 
get 20% off when you spend 60 pounds. And that was sent around apparently to people who had subscribed to, to whatever it was. Nick, did you get that? Did you get the email? You seem like the type I of didn't, I didn't get the email. Okay. Um, well, no, I'm not signed up to the rugby store, unsurprisingly, uh, given the way that we've played in the last few years. Um, but, anyway, but I did want to just come in on what Chris said quickly and, and yeah. just say it's it's completely true the way that it was being displayed on in the coverage after that it was the most shocking thing in the world. And when I went into Twickenham that day, I truly believed it was going England were going to lose that game. Everything, everything in the build up, there was nothing to indicate that England were going to go and beat Fiji, which is why I use that kind of lethal injection analogy, because it's something that you know is going to happen, but you're still shocked. I was still a bit shocked when it did, but um, there's, there was absolutely nothing to indicate that England were going to win that game. And it is truly yeah. just probably a little bit my own English arrogance, which was the thing that was stopping me believing that it could. I think it's the way it's reported as well. I think that publicly, I think that's je je definitely the case. I was working for Amazon Prime at the weekend and I was doing their sort of Twitter and I did a poll who's going to win England or Fiji. And this was to keep in mind, this was to an audience that was primarily English. 42% said they thought Fiji would win. Now, that's quite high. And yet it's being report reported as the biggest shock ever. Now, a big shock is a 70-30 you know, or an 80-20, not 42%. Um, so in conclusion, Duncan, are the English arrogant? <laughs> I, I, I just I think there's just potentially a misunderstanding just now about how with the, some of the parts now, Samoa, Tonga, play Scotland in the World Cup, Fiji, give them proper prep. And with some of the eligibility rules that have come in, that the, these teams are 20, 25% better than they were a year ago. I've got no doubt about that. Um, so, and I, and I think potentially the wider public, well, it seems like they did in that poll, they did understand that, but maybe, maybe it's just an easy story for the press to write that it's a hugely, huge surprise when I actually don't think it's a massive surprise as, as probably we're alluding to here. That's, that's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I mean, there's a, there, there, I, I should point out, uh, Ollie, um, to someone who's young enough to be my grandson, um, that Twitter is now called X. So come on, catch up, please. Um, uh, sorry. I mean, I mean you're, you're, you're really, yeah, yeah keep, keep, stay, keep down with the kids, mate. Uh, that, that's the thing. I, I, I do, I do think that there's, there's a general misunderstanding in, in, in the way sport is covered, sport in general. Uh, or the big sports in general is covered uh, in the press. And crikey, I spent I spent twenty odd years in Fleet Street. I sort of know how the thing works. But there's a misunderstanding of England's place in the world. It's not just a misunderstanding of a of a twenty five percent improvement in Fiji and Samoa. There is always this assumption, always this assumption. And when the assumption doesn't fulfil itself, there's an extraordinary reaction of this is the worst ever. And I don't really buy it. I seriously don't buy it. I mean, it's, 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 Fiji were good winners, good winners on Saturday. They could have won by more. Certainly could have won by more. And um, and it, it just, I do take some sort of, uh, some sort of glee at times, even though I'm as English as the day is long. Uh, I do take some glee that the old England, it's the West Country in me, basically, that the, 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 the old establishment assumption that England are going to beat everyone except the All Blacks and and, um, uh, and the Springboks. I do find it sticks in the craw a little bit, and I, I just think it's laughable these days. So I think the, the, the playing field is levelling, and the more it levels, the happier I am, because I'd like to see good contests. I don't want to see hammerings. England missed 27 tackles against Fiji, so you have to say that the work Kevin Sinfield is doing is coming under fire a little bit. And obviously, Steve Borthwick has very much handpicked his coaching staff to be the mould that he wants it to be. It hasn't worked so far, without a doubt. Um, and one thing that's called into question is whether there is the requirement for a Southern Hemisphere coach in a Northern Hemisphere backstop. Um, and Duncan, I wanted to ask you about this because obviously you went into Fiji um into the Fiji setup as you know heralding from Scotland do you feel that that mix and match is important to have in an international setup given the different styles that each nation will play yeah I think this 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 uh, on this sort of topic I think there's probably two key things 
I think one, whoever the head coach is, has to be comfortable with his staff. I think, you know, you know, and I think we probably all, you know, associate that with our working lives. And it's it's good to work with people you know and trust and good people. So I think that's one point, you know. So and sometimes when you get that, you might lose out in a bit of, I don't know, technicality somewhere else or a bit of information somewhere else. And probably the second bit is, as you're saying, is, you know, it is important to have different opinions, different sort of mindset, different experiences. So for me, it's always sort of balancing off the two. And I, I, I don't think there's any massive kind of right or wrong. I just think whoever the head coach is has got to make those those sort of calls and sort of balance that off. But certainly when a new person comes in, I think it, it is good and refreshing and they can whether it's even challenging the coaches to coaching methods styles questioning whatever that might be but it is also important that if you're a head coach you've got so much going on that you you need to have people you sort of trust around you um yeah so i've kind of budged the answer slightly but I think it's, 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 a, it's a balance of those two things and it's it's not an easy thing and again availability of coaches and Timing is 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 not a sort of perfect science either. This this is a pretty inexperienced thing, the coaching team, isn't it? I, I mean, look, Borthwick's been coaching, been coaching since around you know sort of 2015 when he was when he was with Eddie in in Japan, uh, and you know, I mean, everyone who knows Steve knows how, um, even though he he really loathes the public facing side of the job it's really not him he's always been pretty suspicious of of the press and a very guarded individual but technically and analytically and what have you I mean Steve will you know there won't be too many people who know a fat lot more about his areas of expertise than Steve does but Kevin Sinfield I mean I'm sure you know he, he could be the next Sean Edwards who, who knows but he's relatively new and he's come from a different sport. Richard Wigglesworth is relatively new. He was playing 10 minutes ago. It was, you know, and, and suddenly he's in charge of the England attack. So then it all comes down to what input do the senior players have in, you know, in the in the coaching and strategic and tactical mix. And that's something without being in the in the inner sanctum at Penny Hill Park. I don't know how much Owen Farrell or Ellis Genge or George Ford or what have you have to say on these things and, and how they're trying to shape England's game in partnership with the coaches. You imagine George Ford. I mean, from my experience of George, is a real student of the game. What Brian Ashton would have called a real student of the game. So George, will, uh, you imagine, would be bringing a hell of a lot to that mix, whether he's starting the game or not. But quite how that's working out behind closed doors, I don't know. Look, I we've got Jerry Jerry Guscott coming on next week, so I'm sure England will be thrown under the microscope even more then. So just one more question on this discussion before I put a pin on it and we move on to Scotland. Um, England's attack looked very different when Marcus Smith came on at 15. Freddie Stewart, question marks about his defence, about his pace, um, about his positioning and potentially not offering enough with ball in hand. Obviously, he's a master under the high ball. Um, it was a pseudo B-Tech, Richie Moonga, Bowden Barrett type situation when Smith came on. Nick, you're smiling. What did you make of it before I asked Duncan? Uh, yeah, no, I, th- I thought they d- I, it was great actually. In the first sort of five minutes after Smith came on, it seemed like they just threw everything out the window. Actually, did something with a penalty advantage that wasn't kicking for field position or you know trucking up in the forwards for four or five phases. Um, nice little chip through. A lot of desire from Mark Smith, and I thought. Um, after the game, I went and had a few drinks with some friends and they were all saying how embarrassed they were to see Marcus Smith like geeing up the troops and, and trying to trying to motivate everyone. But but that's exactly what you need to do. You know, you need to even if it is against Fiji, you need to keep you need need to believe that you can get back into the game and you need to show that kind of level of desire. And I think that that was missing. Stewart had an awful day at the office. Whether Marcus Smith is a man to replace him there, I'm not sure. But perhaps in attack they want him. Uh, you know, they they want him in the wide wide channels, um, creating opportunities from there and from the back. You know, if he if he is solid under a high ball, which Marcus Smith is, not quite got the height though to compete with some of the 
taller wingers in the game. Um, but whether they they trust him to be able to to run it back in and and create opportunities from there as well, counter attacking opportunities, I'm not sure. But mm, it seems like a really it it concerns me. Um, along with the fact that George Ford says that the training level isn't very good at the moment, it concerns me that these things are happening so close to a World Cup. Decisions are being made like that. I mean, you know, Chris was touching on George Ford. I mean, the fact that he was talking. It's it's never a good sign when someone's talking about the training level not being good. And as Chris alluded to, he'll he'd know just as well as anyone. So I just think it's a symptom of uh, this England team getting really panicked in the lead up to the tournament. If Marcus Smith starts World Cup games at 15, oh, uh, I think I might go and chuck myself off Clippers and Spencer Bridge. I mean, it's a specialist position. You'll kick all day to him. It'll be horrendous. I mean, Jason Robinson, who could do brilliant things anywhere on the field, probably in any form of in any form of contact sport, was, a, in my judgment, an immeasurably better left wing, or probably a better right wing as well, than he ever was at fullback. I mean, I, I can remember England players saying about Jason when he got injured, well, at least whoever comes in next week will know what they're going to do. Now, at 15... That's quite a difficult. If you're completely unpredictable to your own teammates, that's quite a difficult. That's quite a difficult position. It's all very well doing the the, the individual tripping the like fantastic on the wings. Fantastic. You're the sort of end of a process. Even if you've come in field, you're the sort of end of a process. But fifteen is fundamental to an entire attacking strategy uh, and a defensive strategy. And if you're if if fifty percent of that is is go- gone down the swanee because you're only five foot three. That's quite a difficult call to make. I don't do think you remember, Chris, do you remember Hugo Monia's one appearance at fullback as well. Sorry, Hugo Monia's appearance for yeah, uh, and there was a reason there was only one. There was a reason. Talk, <laughs> talk to Mark Quato about it. That was <laughs> an unbelievable thing. I mean, someone had to be the brains of that back three. Chris Ashton was on one wing, Hugo was at fifteen, and Mark Quato was on the other wing. Uh, uh, here endeth the lesson. I'm out of my pool right now. <laughs> I mean, we've been campaigning for Freddie Stewart at 12 for a year and a half on the Rugby Paper podcast. Now I think Clive Woodward has said exactly the same thing. Duncan, just weigh, on, weigh, not, well, weigh in on this before um, we move on. Yeah, I mean, very briefly, Luke, I think we all, well, certainly with our attacking heads on, we all like, um, you know, two ball players, two two playmakers, two bits of, an, or sorry, an added bit of unpredictability, but I'll, I'll pretty much concur with what's been said. I've I find it slightly alarming that with 20 minutes to go before you start your next World Cup match that you know we're you know we're, we're throwing in an untried 15. I mean, if I was a coach, I'd want to be you know I think we you, you surely you want to know exactly, but you pretty much know your first team for the first game against Argentina in 10 days time. You would think. Um, so that that'd be yeah. I totally agree with that. But that's the bit that sort of slightly worries me. Um, but... Scotland have a whole tradition of outstanding international 15s going back to God knows how, going back to Ken Scotland probably, but right the way through your Irvins and your Gavin Hastings and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the common denominator, they were all fullbacks. But I, I, and on this point, so we'll maybe come to this, but I think this is where Scotland have got it right this time with Gregor in that. Previously, one of the accusations about Gregor would have been the constant changing of the team. Now, pretty much for three of the four test matches that Scotland have just had, you could, you, they've pretty much gone strongest team, strongest combinations. Like, you know, we pretty much, I, well, I dare say, apart from maybe a spot in the back row, I could tell you the Scotland, you know, we, we could all guess the Scotland team, um, which, which is in contrast to what we're saying there about England, I think. Um, and that's, I think, Gregor's probably taken that on board from previous World Cups and chopping and changing and who's in the squad, who's out, you know, week to week, who's, you know, there's there's always been, oh, we'll try him or he's trained well or that rhetoric is kind of gone, right? This is our strongest team. We're going to give them minutes on the pitch and this is what we're going with. That's what it looks like to me. I was going, just going back a, 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 a couple of, sort of mini conversations ago when we were talking about the fact that the England the England coaching squad is relatively inexperienced, actually. Do you think with Gregor, who, who um, I'm sure wasn't the complete maverick he was sometimes painted as as a player, but he had that 
he had that he had that side to him certainly i mean gregor's really been through the fires hasn't he as a as a coach do you do you think that he's now he's now coaching at something towards an optimum level because he's had this a massive experience good and bad um, yeah no I, I i do i do i do agree with that and also he you know he's what is he? He's probably nearly eight years in that post, which is yeah. unusual for one. But then, then you get the benefit of what you're saying there is that he's experienced a lot in there, probably learned a lot, and an accumulation being that I think we are seeing a different, more, more settled kind of Scotland coaching setup and side. And within that, along the way, there's actually been a fair bit of churn of coaches, um, but there has been a couple of constants in there. Um, so yeah, no, I think it is. It's, it's a good point, and it probably is true. And, and is there finally, in 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 your in your judgment, Duncan, a, a genuine meeting of minds between Gregor and, and Finn Russell? Because uh, I mean, there was all the, there was all the, the traffic in the papers about Finn and and falling out with Gregor, and you know the big standoff, blah 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 blah. But but they're now seen. They now seem to have found a page they can both sing from. Yeah, I'm mean, like I mean I mean I coached Finn when he was when he was young, you know, sort of 2013, just straight into that team. And was I was good. <laughs> but I mean, around that time, you know, around that time, you know, Scotland's attack and just the players we had was, you know, uh, fairly limited. And then around that time, Finn Russell came on board, Stuart Hall came on board, Mark Bennett came on board, Tim Visser qualified. So all of a sudden, around that time, he started to have some sort of firepower. Um, and look, I'm close enough to it that I don't want to ask the ins and outs, and I generally don't know them. But you know, when when considering what's gone on, and then Finn Russell's captain two games ago, you've you've got to assume that yeah. um, you don't take that lightly. So I can only assume things are pretty rosy, and certainly it seems to be getting displayed on the pitch as well, which is which is the main thing. Is this the best Scotland's backline has ever looked? Do you think? Yeah, I think so. I think it's the best team Scotland's ever had. I don't think there's any debate. I mean, you might get, you know, players from the, I don't know, 60s or 70s or 80s saying something, you know, and this comparison's been made, but well, take the pro era, certainly. I mean, they are strong. Um, I'm, there's a couple of positions they don't have huge strength and depth, and I think that's where teams will target them, but you know, you look at some of the competition at centre, in the back row, in the back three. Um, you know, they're, they're strong all over, really. Currently as well, have very few injuries. So they've been lucky there. Um, so look, they should be, they should be, should be confident. And, you know, they are definitely a strong team. Just to zoom in a bit on those positions that lack depth, which are they in the way you see it? Yeah, I mean, front front row, Um you know, behind Xander at tight head, the whole front row probably will. I mean, I think they're strong, but I mean, I think they're going to get targeted there by um, South Africa and Ireland. Other than that, I mean, they're pretty strong. You know, probably add in front five. You know, you've got Gilchrist, Richie Gray, Skinner, uh, good players. Um, back row, you've got tons. Uh, you've got good nines behind Finn. And I'm, that's not a reflection on Ben Healy. That's a reflection on how good Finn is. Um, the the drop off is there, and that's that's just because Finn's a standout. I mean, it, my belief is that if Finn's playing, Scotland can beat anyone. Um, if he's not, they can't. Um, it's fairly black and white for me, and that's just because Finn can do some incredible things and do he, he just terrifies defenses. Um, and look, he may make a couple of mistakes, but he'll just as easily create. You know, you could be, you know, they could be getting pounded. You know, after sixty minutes, Finn's still on the pitch. Two bits of magic. You know, there's 10, 12, 14 points that can turn a game. Um, and then back three, you've got Stain, Darcy, Duhan. You know, centers. Jesus, three or four centers are all all good players as well. When you um when you talk about the type five Duncan and 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 I don't suppose you spent much time in the type five on the field um but on 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 Friday night the Springboks went with a, a seven one split on the bench and put on seven new forwards I think simultaneously am I right Nick 
Um, I, uh, yeah. I, I mean, it's it, it, it was as near as damn it. I mean, that, that I mean, I, I think that that's distorting the game, and that's a whole new, that's a whole new, um, that's a whole new discussion as whether whether we should even be going down that road. But that's where we are at the moment. When you're playing them in a world in a World Cup pool match, they could easily do the same thing to you. Can can Scotland live with that? Uh, well, that'll be the that'll be the question mark of how far the Scotland team have come, and largely in terms of sort of depth of squad, but also in terms of fitness. Like I know teams will, and and this is regional wise as well. This is not just national. Will have targeted Scotland, kind of fitness conditioning wise in the back end of games. Um, and look, I, I, my belief is that that's still where South Africa and Ireland will go at Scotland with that. Power that last 20, 25 half hour of the game. And that's and that's the point. I mean, you know, you can't tell me Ireland are gonna bring, you know, like for like Scotland make two, three changes in the backs, Ireland do so. Is it gonna affect the game? Not, not hugely for me. It'll be like you say, in that pivotal up front, who's got what with half hour to go coming off the bench. I think that's that'll be a real sort of story. Talk to me a little bit about Jack Dempsey. Would he be your starting eight with the way he's playing over Matt Ferguson? It looks like it. I mean, Jack's done incredibly well. Um, I don't know. Yes, it's a tricky balance because Matt and Jack are the same. They're both sort of ball carriers. Jamie Ritchie, the captain, is probably less of a ball carrier. Then you've got Rory Darge and Tamish Watson who are quite the same the sort of blend of that is is tricky but it probably it looks like you know Darja Watson Dempsey and 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 Jamie Ritchie at six looks like it um you could maybe argue that they're half a ball carrier light uh, considering their front five as well when you play the the really good teams there which is what Matt Ferguson might add um so yeah yeah, perhaps half a ball carrier light. Although Hamish Watson, at the peak of his powers, is a very, very good ball carrier. Yeah, and it's whether he starts against Rory. Um, yeah, and I mean, I, you know, I've coached all these guys, but Rory's one of these guys. He is, you know, I, I, I think a lot of people would never seen his ball carrying ability as a, as a sort of young kid. He was always very athletic, great over ball, always has been. But some of the physical stuff and the line breaks and the impact he's had in attack um, has been sensational in the last couple of years as well, which kind of matches. And that's probably why he's now up with, with Hamish. Cause that, as you say, that used to be Hamish's um, sort of 40. That was his sort of, sort of superpower as it were. To have him back, to have Darge back fit and playing as he is, I think that's a really big step for Scotland. Yeah. I, I think he's a genuine difference maker. Um, I, and it'll, it'll be better in four years' time, injuries willing. But he's a genuine, I think he's a really good player. I know I, I keep in touch with Gregor a little bit, and I know how much he thinks of him. He's 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 some talent, that, that guy. He's the, you yeah. don't get many, not many of them around. No, he, he's good, and he's um, he's a, he's a good boy as well. He's he's he's, he's quality all around. The only other sort of point of selection difference I have at the moment is on the wing. Darcy Graham has obviously been injured, then came back, and now he's got a slight quad tweak, um, is the way it's being reported. Carl Stain has very much filled his boots in his absence. Who would you start out of the two of them? Um, I would probably go Darcy, slightly for the same reason that I've I've mentioned about Finn Russell. Um, so Kyle's obviously a very, very good player, done incredibly well, quite a different type of winger, you know, big, physical, solid you know, very few errors, but Darcy's more in that um, sort of Finn Russell mould. And I, not that Darcy, you know, makes mistakes, but he can, he, he can just do some freaky stuff. Like, he, you know, he, he can just beat a couple of players and give you five or seven points out of nothing, really. Um, so for me, Darcy, Darcy would, if he's fit, would, would start. It's interesting because you're, well, You've just said uh, uh, 10 minutes ago or so that there's such good depth in most of these positions. 
I've asked you maybe two selection conundrums. There are maybe a couple of others, question marks at seven, like you say, um, maybe at nine as well. Other than that, I guess it's the perfect balance between having a lot of depth, but like in the case of France, for example, you still have players who are putting their hands up and saying, right, this jersey's mine, and then also having someone who can take their place and still do a job. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's probably one of the tricks of the World Cup as well, is that, you know, sort of formulating a plan. Like, I mean, these guys have already been in camp for whatever it is, 10, 12 weeks. You've got another six of it coming up. Um, and no one likes, you know, and I dare say I've sort of been there, but no one likes holding a bag or not being part of the squad or not feeling you're part of the squad. So it'll be how, and I don't just mean Gregor here, I mean all coaches during the World Cup keep keep essentially the, the 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 fringe guys active, keep them engaged, give them chances to keep put the hand up for selection as well. And it's um it's 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 a it's a tricky bit, and it's less tricky when your team's going well. It's when you maybe lose a game or you're scraping through a game, and then questions get asked, and then players start to get irate, and that's that's kind of how it works. Um, you know, keep winning, keep performing well, and then everyone can get sort of mingled in. Is 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 a good combination. Duncan, one of the players who came out of the Six Nations. Um, with uh, a hell of a lot of credit, having started it in a general sort of state of wider anonymity, if you like, was uh, Tripolotu. Can you give us some idea of his importance to how that back line works, given you've got a 10 of Finn Russell's very distinctive uh, type and, you, and you've got a, a runner as good as Hugh Jones and you've got some real gas is is he just the cement between the bricks? Is he? Yeah, I mean not, exactly. I mean, he, he's not a guy I'd seen a lot of before he came over, and I still don't know. Him. You know, he's probably one of the that back line that I know the least well. Um, but for example, look, I went through to Glasgow uh, just to see a couple of this about six months ago, and he was straight up shaking my hand, blah blah blah. You didn't know me from Adam, and but seems like an absolute genuine guy. Um, obviously, he's taken a sort of leadership role. Um, so he's obviously highly respected there. And I think the other bit which ties in with your word around sort of cement and glue is that I'd probably seen him as a kind of sort of ball carrying, you know, gain line type of center. But, you know, what we're seeing is he is, he's either had these, he's either developed his game or we just hadn't seen this other part of his game because like you say, he does everything. You, you know, you've got to watch him running, you've got to watch him passing, you've got to watch him kicking. Um, so he's, he's, so he's a great foil, foil because, you know, you've got Hugh who can, you know, has got a couple of attributes. You've got Finn inside him who's got the full box as well. So, you know, between the three of them, they can almost tailor to whatever, you know, game plan, weather, whatever kind of comes at them, they can adapt and and sort of fire some shots. So he's it's incredibly important in rugby. It's incredibly important in rugby to have the straight man somewhere, isn't it? it it's um, you know, you look at that England back row in 03, Delalio, massive name, Neil Bat, massive name, Richard Hill's public profile. I mean, completely undeservedly, because to me, he's one of the great blindside flankers has ever been. But his public profile was minimal. I mean, I mean, almost invisible compared to quite a lot of the players around him. But crikey, he was important, just as the straight man, really. Yeah, no, and I think, and that's what Sione can, he, he's he got that role in him, but he does, he clearly has a lot more as well. So it's, um, yeah, they've they've got a pretty settled midfield there now, and they've got some good guys in behind as well, too. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. I think it's a world-beating midfield, um, actually, without doubt. Um, let's do your random rugby 15 very, very quickly. I've just got a couple more um, things I want to talk about on the Scotland front very, very briefly at the end. But let's do the random rugby 15 first, if that's good with you, Duncan. Yeah. Yeah, let's get straight into it. Nickname? Hodgie. <laughs> Better rugby memory? Uh, England, being England 2000. Most embarrassing rugby memory? Uh, I think it was probably the next year actually playing England and oh no it was 2002 I missed a couple of kicks I should have got and I just didn't I couldn't look anyone in the eye it was just horrible should never happened but it did were the kicks from straight in front 
No straight in front, but just on a public stage, just a couple yeah. of comments I should have got. Just that was my job. I know history tells us otherwise, Duncan, but you Scots, you've got to let this England thing go. I, mean, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I don't know, but, the, but this is the thing with me. I, I don't know. Yeah. I, <laughs> I probably didn't. I mean, I think there's about three or four years I did start against England, which wouldn't have been the case with any other country. So it does seem to be sort of me and me and England. Don't know why. Uh, where are we? Pre-game tune. Um, I can't remember one specific, but at Scotland, when you try score, it used to be song two by Blur. It used to come out afterwards if that's an alternative. Post-game meal. Um, anything really pizza ideally best player you've played against it's hard to pick one but I again I played against Marshall, Mertens, Lomu Cullen um, Umaga so I'm going to go Lomu <laughs> I, 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 like yeah. the whole all black back line pretty much played about <laughs> three times in a year and yeah. half up every time have you ever had to tackle Jonah Yes, and I actually tell a story that my, my son actually laughs about. So if you've got time, I'll quickly tell you. But I literally, I could see him. This was in, this was at Carisbrook 2000, so after that England game. And I literally, I could see him in behind Mertens. I'm like, all right, here you go, strap, strap yourself in. He's coming straight down your channel. Now, sure enough, and I thought, I literally thought I'd whacked him, kind of, you know, but bit staring it up. I thought he's bound to be lying just beside me. And literally looked over my right shoulder and he's still got another two or three yards back, about 10 metres behind me. I thought I'd whack him. But, yeah. Best player you've played with? I'm going to go Gary Armstrong on that. Nice. Favourite player right now? Uh, I love Dupont. Rugby uh, idol. Tricky. When I was growing up, I loved John Rutherford, David Campisi. Gavin Hastings, and then was lucky enough to play with Gavin as well. So those sort of three, probably. Favourite stadium? Um, Welsh, Cardiff, Millennium. Favourite gym exercise? I certainly wasn't bench. Um, I'm going to go dips. I'm going to go dips. That was my only sort of super strength in the gym. That's a new one. We haven't had dips yet. Uh, occupation if rugby didn't exist? Good question. Um, I would have loved to have been a cricketer. Love my cricket. Nice. What do you do? Um, mainly batsman, bowl to sort of keep myself busy, but batter. Superstitions. Used to like being out the changing room last, but the other one I am renowned for was as a ten. Um, I used to hate wet boots. Hate them. So Friday night I would dub in three pairs of boots. And I know some of the listeners here might not know what dubbing is, I get that. But that was to keep my boots dry. So I would arrive at the ground on a rainy day and the, the kit guy would have three pairs of socks. So I'd put boots and socks, warm up, they'd get all wet and baggy, strip them off. First half, new socks, new boots. Second half, new socks, new boots. Wow. <laughs> yeah. But that's an extensive pretty much routine. Goodness me. <laughs> Who, what was it? Campo that said he washes his car before a game. That was pretty extensive, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and what's he, what's he doing parking it on the halfway line anyway? <laughs> it's the only way you stop Jonah Lomu. <laughs> you won't do. Yes, drive at him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, rugby law, you would change. Oh, um, I think it links into what we said earlier. I would, I would look at substitutions. I think. We are breeding um, people who are not fit for 80 minutes of rugby. And then bringing on some fully fresh yeah. monsters 30 minutes out. That would reduce the size of players. And that for me is a, yeah. a quite a logical, easy one for me. And lastly, best thing about working in rugby? Um, just, well, just the, the people. You know, working in a team sport is just amazing, whether it was playing or coaching or, you know, now coaching and coaching kids. It's, uh, it's um, I genuinely consider myself very, very lucky. Perfect. Top stuff. That was a great little round of Rugby 15. Thank you for doing that, Duncan. Um, okay. Five, ten minutes left, if that works with everyone. Um, 
Well, you're always the one in a rush to go, Ollie. So um, it's entirely down to you. <laughs> I don't yeah, know. Bigger and better like things, for Ollie. It's because of your multiple jobs with all the very. Uh, uh, he's, he's hosting a podcast for Amazon Prime after this. <laughs> <laughs> well, indeed. Yeah, in fact, you're the company nominated. He's got, he's got an identical <laughs> script. This bit is not making the edit. Can I just say? <laughs> yeah. You're the common denominator in rugby's governance crisis. <laughs> you, you, you seem to be present when anything goes wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't present at Twickenham on Saturday. Nick was. That wasn't a governance issue. Well, it may have been. Actually. I think it was, but that's a whole other issue. We're not opening today because we'll be here all night and I really do have to go. Yeah. Um, okay, let's. so Duncan, can I get a... I don't want a full prediction yet, but if Scotland do get out, of their pool of death, who are they getting out instead of? Oh, um, I think Ireland. Okay, instead of the world number one, one ranked, ranked side. Nick, is that answer <laughs> testament to how good South Africa were looking on Friday? Yeah, I would say exactly the same thing as Duncan, and I wouldn't have said that before Friday. But I agree. Um, sorry, there's someone smashing something in, in the background. <laughs> um, but no, I mean they were they were just the that forward pack, the performance from South Africa's forward pack on Friday was just unbelievable. I mean they were just they look they looked technically they were brilliant. They were obviously incredibly powerful incredibly fit as well yes obviously seven of them came off pretty much at one time but they were just it's just unplayable completely unplayable for any other team in the world which is why I also found it I, I am finding it quite bizarre that England are trying to do an impression of them with a pack that's probably about 100 kilos lighter um, but yeah no I mean it, that's going to be really really hard to play against and their intensity as well across the park with the best atmosphere Twickenham's probably ever had on Friday, it was you know uh, New Zealand didn't play well, but any team would have would have been in big big trouble that day. The one caveat to this is that New Zealand went in. I mean, they don't have um, and Duncan was talking about backup and and what have you in key positions. They don't have another Tyrrell Lomax or Tyrell Lomax. That that's pretty clear. And they lost him early, and he's very important to them. Uh, they didn't have Vitalik and they didn't have Frizzell. So, um, and and I, I I agree with Nick. I mean, watching it on the TV, it seemed that New Zealanders, in terms of the emotional, the the emotional dimension, were a mile mile off it, um, opposed to the South Africans. I think I think a huge amount of um, of intensity. The the intensity gap was massive. Duncan, I'm guessing Friday's performance was the main, not the main motivator, but a significant motivator behind your answer. Yeah, de definitely. Um, I mean, obviously, South Africa have, looks like they've tried to make some sort of strategic changes in how they play. But then when you see the raw power and, you know, 16, 17 forwards that, you know, can all do a massive job and that's still is where the game is going to be, you know, won and lost. So to sort of have that sort of combination of that up front bit, Plus, you know, some of the some of the pace and the tries they can score and you know they they can score from anywhere as well now. So um yeah, I mean that is the and that's that's not taking anything away from Ireland who are an incredible team and rightly, you know, up there. But I just I, I also think Scotland are better matched. Um again, going back to some of what we discussed, are better matched to match Ireland than they are to match South Africa. Yeah. That's how many how many hours are coaches um, are coaches spending looking at Kane and Moody all of a sudden? Yeah, that was that was that was some performance at thirteen from him. Correct. Yeah. No, and there's there's some of the little bits of skill where he intercepts that ball and then suddenly flicks it around someone's back. I was like, who's this guy? It was incredible. Yeah, it was superb. That that moment was just yeah, and and it does epitomise the fact that their backs are incredibly skillful. Mm. It's not it's not like a South African team of old. Definitely um, not. It, it, it almost it almost sounds like an idiot's guide to rugby, doesn't it? Pick the most powerful people you have available to you up front, and the paciest people you have available to you behind, and you might win more than you lose. Yeah, that's actually a really um, good point. Uh, I, might, I might take up coaching actually. Yeah. So, all of, all of the analysis around the game at the end of the day, if you can pick powerful forwards and skillful pacing yeah. backs, you're going to well, do all right. Chris, it's the whole point Chris of England. 
Chris oh. Ingram's version of that is Billy Vanapola as most powerful and Max Malins as most speedy. So what do you make of that? Well, um, well um, I don't. I, I, mean, I, 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 I just think he's going to be behind the curve in, in, in a number of ways. I, I think I think they've been... Loyalty is a great thing, but I think that they've hung their hat on players who have passed their best. Well, this is the most experienced World Cup squad of all time. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but then... And people play more matches than they've ever done before. So you know, I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm not a great one for those kinds of statistics, but I don't, I don't see where Vunapola is ahead of Zach Mercer in in a contest for this World Cup. I don't see, and you, too long, you know my feelings about him. Yeah, most overrated player in the history of the world. <laughs> Right, Chris's scowl has now gone to a genuine look of resignation. So I'm gonna um ask Duncan to just say a little bit about Stuart Hogg. It's, it's been a sort of odd type of retirement in the sense that because everyone's focused on the World Cup, because I suppose there were question marks over his starting spot anyway, I personally don't feel that he's got the, the send-off he deserves. But just say a little bit about what Hogg has done for Scotland, because obviously in his day, and most people would argue that was probably not the last couple of years, he was one of, if not the most potent attacking weapon in Europe. Yeah, I mean, he's he's one of these guys that can do anything. You know, I first saw him actually probably when he was about 15 or 16 years old and I saw him kick a ball and I'm like, who is this? You know, at that time, he was a tiny, scrawny little kid, sort of long, floppy hair. Um, but he, he again, he can do everything. He can run, he can kick, he's abrasive. Um, and again, he came into the Scotland team. I think he got capped down in Wales would have been 2012, 2013, at a time when Scotland didn't have much firepower, shall we say. You know, and, and he, certainly attacking-wise, probably for about 10 years, has been the sort of leading attacking light. And yes, there's been guys within that, you know, your Tommy Seymour's and Mark Bennett's and Visser and, you know, Finn alongside that, um, you know. But he's been the sort of one constant every game that I guarantee if you're sitting in an opposition team room, you know, analysis department, you go, well, we've got to watch this guy. We've got to watch this guy. We've got to watch this guy. And, um, you know, and to, you know, like get all the caps he's got, the play as well as he has done um, is is incredible. And, yeah, I think with the World Cup, it has gone under the radar sort of slightly and it was a surprise. But um, I think when, when people look back, he'll still be, you know, you know, one of Scotland's best ever players. The replacement's not a bad player, though, Duncan. What was that? Sorry, the replacement's not a bad player. I, yeah, I, mean, I, I think Warns, you know, in a very different way. Um, I, th- I think he's he's oh, he, interesting in many ways as Hogwarts. I mean, I I genuinely tell the story. I, I watched a school game about two minutes from my house here, and I, and Blair was maybe sixteen at the time, and I watched him. I only saw one half, and I watched him do three things in about five minutes. One was a kick, one was a pass, and one was a run. And I'm like, who is that? And he's a freak, you know, he's, he's six foot three, six foot four, hugely athletic, kick, pass, run. He's, you know, and obviously there's been this debate in the last two, three years, around 10, 15, and he just looks in his own skin just now at 15. He looks really good and he's so threatening with the ball in hand, especially close to the line. You just can't, you can't trap him and the ball at the same time. He's got this sort of go gadget arm that just, springs around and that's why he did so well at 10 when he when you get sort of free plays down near the goal line he's absolutely lethal um and obviously in open space you know you, you can't tackle the ball like you've got to he's so tall that he then can just release other players so you no know, he he looks um he looks great I think it's come to the point, Duncan, where I'm putting you on the spot and getting a, we've done this with every nation, we've done a rundown, so to speak, of a prediction. Where is Scotland getting to in the 2023 World Cup? I think they might get out of the group. Okay. Yeah. Of- and, and then it's going to be tricky. Um, I, <laughs> I don't think they'll win the group. I think they can come second. Then they're going to come up against... Well, France and New Zealand, which is which is tough. So I'll I'll go quarterfinals, quarterfinals, and then I suppose off the back of the weekend, you'd say that France may now be in pole position to top their group. So a loss to France in the quarterfinals. Yeah, it looks like that. But yeah, 
I enjoy that you said we'll get out of the group and then it'll be tricky as if getting out of the group wasn't already tricky. <laughs> Ooh, harsh. That's really harsh. I know. I mean, I think I think everyone's on the same page. Like they're in a nightmare group, aren't they? Um, yeah. You know, so that would be a huge achievement to get out of the group. But I mean, I, I think as I say with the Scotland team, I, I genuinely believe on the day they can beat anyone. If the right people are on the pitch and are fit and they play well, like, you know, they played France, what, uh, away from home, France's top team, and ran them extremely close. Yeah. Um, so I don't see why that should be any different against Ireland and, and South Africa. You yeah. see the headlines tomorrow, can't you? We'll walk it, says Hodge. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, I'm, make, I'm making time stamps for the article that I'm going to write later in the week. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's get <laughs> Don't worry, we're generous journalists, Duncan. Uh, Oh, cool. We'll wrap up there, guys. Uh, massively look for... We're 10 days away now. 10 days away from the tournament opening. Um, but Duncan, yeah, awesome having you on. And I hope we do see Scotland in a quarterfinal and potentially even beyond. Thanks for listening to this week's edition of the Rugby Paper Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe on whichever podcast platform you use and recommend the show to your friends. The Rugby Paper is available to buy every Sunday. And to make sure you don't miss it, subscribe through our print, digital and online options at therugbypaper.co.uk forward slash subscriptions. That's therugbypaper.co.uk forward slash subscriptions to get all our content for as little as 14p per day.